One of the more celebrated aspects of contemporary media is that it seems so much more participatory. At least in principle, anyone can establish, for example, a Twitter or a YouTube account and share their experiences or views with minimal censorious intervention. Some have explained this apparently more participatory media culture with reference to the capacities of technologies. After all, people can participate more easily when so many media functions are collapsed into an internet-enabled device like a smartphone. And yet, for others, this technological explanation is flawed. It underplays longer-term cultural shifts, in which these new technologies might more properly be seen as crystallizing. Media Technology and Culture is a podcast series by me, Scott Rogers. In this series, we'll be taking a thematic look at media, understood as technologies. We explore the histories of media, as well as more recent developments, and not always necessarily in a linear progression. Some of you listeners will also be students in my module, Media Technology and Culture, in which we'll discuss and work on some of these themes in more detail. This is the second edition of the series, which includes some new elements added to the episode in autumn 2021. In this episode, the eighth in our series, we focus on participatory technologies. The key idea I want to get across is this. Recent years have indeed seen shifts in how ordinary people and professionals participate in media creation. But explanations for this, which push and pull on the old technology culture dichotomy, are unsustainable. Once again, we need to think of technics and culture as conjoined. Media convergence. What's interesting about the term media convergence is that everyone has been talking about media convergence. Now, to use the buzzword, convergence is here. One important and at one time much hyped concept in debates about whether media are especially participatory today is convergence. In his 2010 book on the concept, Tim Dwyer points out that media convergence refers to a range of things, from the blurring distinction between media producers and audiences, to corporate conglomeration, to the tactics of communication regulators facing rapid change. Specifically, technological convergence is perhaps the most conventional understanding of the idea. In some ways, technological convergence is a more general way of labeling what Lev Manovich describes when he points to the computer as a metamedium, as we discussed in episode 5. This is the idea that virtually any media form or type of media content can be incorporated into the medium of the computer. It relies on a contrast, one where, in the past, there was a one-to-one relationship between mediums and their use. For example, you needed a television to watch programs, newspapers to read news, turntables to play music, and so on. Today, the idea goes, this one-to-one relationship of medium and use has been eroded. There has been a convergence of modes, as Ithiel de Sola Poole predicted in his 1983 book, Technologies of Freedom. If this is the case, it may logically follow that there has also been enhanced participation. After all, multiple media are more and more accessible through a single portal of some kind. One complication, though, is that there is no single portal, no one convergent black box. Rather, there is a proliferation of convergent devices. Smartphones, tablets, laptops, desktops, smart TVs, gaming consoles, wrist wearables, and more. And as for the content and experiences that these devices make accessible, well, these are not converging at all. If anything, there has been a corresponding and remarkable fragmentation. It is a truism by now to think we live in a time of extraordinary technological change, particularly as it pertains to media culture. Recently, there has been a tendency to pin a lot of this on just one year, 2007. The well-known New York Times columnist and author Thomas Friedman has been one of the prominent people to do this. In his 2016 book, Thank You for Being Late, Friedman puts forward the idea that our age of disorientating acceleration really seems to take hold in 2007. In this year, Facebook and Twitter went global, Kindle and Android were released, Airbnb was founded, Google bought YouTube, and IBM created its Watson AI system. And, of course, as we discussed in our last episode, At the very start of that year, Apple co-founder Steve Jobs made that presentation at Macworld San Francisco, where he announced a device called the iPhone. Everything coming together in 2007 is nice journalistic rhetoric. It takes something that is largely arbitrary, a calendar year, and makes it a big basket into which we can place a series of apparently coinciding developments. It is a little crude and simplistic to do this kind of thing, 
But it does alert us to the possibility that something shared or interconnected has been happening in recent times. We're definitely at a moment of transition, a moment where an old media system is dying and a new media system is being born, an era when spectatorial culture is giving way to participatory culture, where a society based on a small number of companies controlling the storytelling apparatus is giving way to a much more complex mediascape where average citizens have the ability to seize control over the media technology and tell their own stories in powerful new ways. Henry Jenkins is a media scholar you will often hear mentioned in discussions about contemporary media and participation. Jenkins is most noted for his opposition to primarily technological explanations for an emerging participatory media culture. For Jenkins, ordinary people's participation in media creation is about more than gadgets, devices, or platforms. Rather, it is a momentous cultural shift towards new and, as we'll see, potentially democratizing forms of communication. Jenkins is probably best known for his 2006 book, Convergence Culture, where he outlines a model of convergence as an ongoing cultural process rather than a technological endpoint. In terms of mediums, Jenkins focuses on how culture flows between and across multiple platforms rather than all content being made available on a single device. In terms of industries, he is more interested in how media companies and professionals are increasingly partaking in each other's activities, rather than questions of corporate mergers and takeovers. In terms of audiences, he is less interested in their use of, say, the newest smartphones than their increasing willingness and desire to seek out and spread across innumerable platforms and sites. At the heart of Jenkins' convergence culture is active participation by ordinary people in media and, in turn, the collective effects that this has. In important respects, Jenkins builds on the tradition of audience studies, which puts into question traditional ideas about the masses or passive spectators being addressed or sold entertainment by producers of the media. If, in our contemporary media culture, so-called audiences are often active producers of content, Jenkins says, we should just disregard the producer-consumer divide and instead speak of participants. He's not saying that all participation is equal, just that the unevenness is not automatically defined in terms of producer and consumer. Others writing about participatory culture, such as Axel Bruns, have pointed out that when you look over the longer span of history, there has never been a pure consumer-producer divide. Industrial production captured media and culture into a relatively one-way value chain of producer, distributor, and consumer. But by the post-war period, it is more accurate to say we lived in a prosumer society in which consumers were encouraged to feed back into and strengthen this value chain. In the case of media, for instance, through letters to the editor, or fan clubs, or focus groups. According to Bruns, today we live in the age of producage, in which content and information are increasingly extended and improved by both professionals as well as everyday users. This remains an uneven process. And devices like smartphones, for example, still largely emerge from a prosumer model. But we also live in a world where we are unlikely, for example, to see the return of a traditional encyclopedia. Despite its obvious weaknesses, something like Wikipedia is clearly more comprehensive and up-to-date. So I'm here in line for the Star Wars convention store, and it looks like it's going to be quite a long wait. But um, I'm excited to wait with them. Maybe I'll get a t-shirt, or maybe they'll sell out before I get there going to be good. Jenkins' way of thinking about the active agency of ordinary people in relation to media is informed by his earlier research on fan cultures. Fandom involves being part of a community of people who not only share an interest in something, such as, for instance, the Star Wars franchise, it is also that they want to share what they know and add bits and pieces to their object of affection. They want to partake in creating a larger universe of meaning. For Jenkins, fandom is a testing ground for possible transformations in participatory media culture more broadly. They are the early adopters, the ones that go to great lengths to participate before it is easy. In effect, they indicate areas of demand. For Jenkins, the upshot of participatory media culture is not just individual. Drawing on a term coined in 1994 by French philosopher Pierre Levey, Jenkins says it makes possible a new kind of collective intelligence. For LeVay, collective intelligence describes a shift comparable to the Renaissance, from an information economy to an economy of sharing and interaction. It has some resonances with Bernard Stiegler's notion of an economy of contribution, operating alongside existing market, public, or gift economies. 
For Jenkins, assembling the contributions of more and more content creators, remixers, or even just sharers means you end up with a more intelligent whole, akin to a murmuration of starlings swooping and diving in unison. Jenkins sees this, quote, as an alternative source of media power, end quote. It is fair to say Jenkins is avowedly positive about participatory media culture. He calls himself a glass-half-full person. His work has also been well-received beyond the academy, for instance, amongst creative professionals interested in building up media franchises or transmedia storytelling. So it is perhaps unsurprising that his work has been the subject of criticism. Jose Van Dyke, in a 2009 article in Media Culture and Society, argues that participatory media culture draws an exaggerated opposition between passive old media audiences and active new media participants. Media research has argued for some time that audiences are active, not necessarily because they contribute content themselves, but as Stuart Hall famously argued, they decode media based on their subjective positioning and everyday milieu. Another issue, Van Dyke says, is a leap of logic where examples drawn primarily from domains akin to fan cultures are said to foretell more general heightened engagement and cultural citizenship. There's an assumption that consumer groups or fan clubs resemble grassroots political movements. Finally, says Van Dyke, Jenkins presents us with a world in which the political economy of media seems to matter less, and yet all this participation is deeply shaped by mainstream media content and the devices and platforms of large-scale companies. We should spend a moment here coming back to Jenkins' treatment of media technologies. Recall for him, convergence is not a product of what he calls media appliances. Particular media devices, platforms, applications, and artifacts are important, but we should see these as historically specific delivery systems. And delivery systems change. What endures, even if also evolving at the same time, are media cultures more broadly. Take storytelling, for example. This is a media culture which is endured through various delivery systems, including, for example, orality, cave paintings, stone tablets, papyrus, typewriters and word processors, newspapers and paperbacks, radio, television and film, software code, hypertext, and video games. For Jenkins, the media at hand here is storytelling, which takes shape through these various delivery systems, none of which entirely reinvent it. First, there's the candidate. It's, it's very different than many campaigns that I've seen. Then there's the strategist behind the candidate. And the campaign manager who leads a 24-7 political operation with one goal, winning the presidency. The connections between digital culture and political participation have been the topic of much discussion and debate, from protest cultures and activism to national elections and neighborhood politics. In the field of electoral politics, Barack Obama's 2008 U.S. presidential campaign is often cited. How did this relatively unknown politician rise so rapidly, and against considerable odds, including a well-funded primary opponent in Hillary Clinton, a hostile media in Fox News, not to mention his identity as a person of color? A frequent answer is that it was the Obama campaign's social media strategy. In it, not everything boiled down to a centrally organized message. Supporters were not expected to coalesce at just one website destination. Instead, the campaign attempted to, and appeared to succeed at, tapping into people's desire to experience and have access to Obama. firsthand if possible, but above all, to be able to publicly affiliate and express a personalized connection. One of the most well-known images from Obama 2008 was not even produced by the campaign, even if it was approved by it. The Hope Poster, created by Shepard Ferry, street artist and owner of the well-known Obey clothing line. The poster was later revealed to be based on a 2006 Associated Press image taken by freelance photographer Manny Garcia. The use of the image was subsequently at the center of a lawsuit case settled out of court in 2011, so the poster itself might be seen as an example of a contentious remix. But it was also the inspiration for a huge volume of mimetic spin-offs. Nope, over an image of competing candidate John McCain looking cross. Dope, over the unflattering image of George W. Bush. Slope, showing Obama sliding, presumably down an approval rating. Internet memes are one of the preeminent forms of participatory media cultures. The term meme has a more general origin, from Richard Dawkins' 1976 book, The Selfish Gene, to describe any copied or imitated cultural unit traveling between people. 
In her 2013 book, Memes in Digital Culture, Limor Schiffman describes internet memes as collections of objects or acts sharing commonality in their content, form, or stance, and which are created, manipulated, and recirculated by numerous participants across digital platforms. I'm here to join the people bringing attention to Lou Gehrig's disease by taking the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. Notice, lots of ice. Don't cheese out. Now, it's in order to raise awareness for ALS, which is a form of motor neuron disease, which has a devastating effect on people's lives. It's all part of a great cause, and uh, everyone should get involved. <laughs> there are many, many types of internet memes. Among the most common are image macros, which are one or more digital images with superimposed text, usually white, uppercase, and in the impact font. The images are usually drawn from popular culture, films like Lord of the Rings or Finding Neverland or reality television like American Chopper. But memes can also be repeated acts, such as videos recorded for the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge in 2014, where people poured buckets of ice water over their heads to raise money for and awareness about motor neuron disease. 2.4 million such videos were shared on Facebook. Participation via memes is political not just in putting across new ideas. As repetitious media forms, Memes also involve reenacting norms. Writing with Noam Gall and Zohar Kampf in a 2016 article in New Media and Society, Schiffman explores 200 YouTube videos, a sample of thousands that followed in the wake of a September 2010 video titled It Gets Better. In the initial video, a gay male couple offer their responses to the suicides of teens subjected to homophobic bullying. Sitting in a cafe, they describe their own challenges and offer encouragement to others facing similar difficulties. High school was bad. I was uh, Catholic, went to Catholic high schools, Catholic boys' school. My dad was a Catholic deacon, my mom was a Catholic lay minister, and my family was very Catholic. And there were no gay people in my family. Very miserable. I lived in Spokane, Washington, which is a mid-sized town with a small town mentality. And... I was picked on mercilessly in school, people were really cruel to me, I was bullied a lot, beat up, thrown against walls and lockers and windows. The form of the video is amateur, and therefore a kind of minor transgression in its authenticity. But Schiffman and her co-authors point out that its content and stance are not particularly transgressive. The protagonists invoke heteronormative ideas about parenthood and the nuclear family. They are white, articulate, able-bodied, young, Christian, and American. And the mimetic responses to this video were markedly conformist vis-a-vis mainstream LGBTQ norms, with low representation of more marginalized groups. In fact, it took a more traditional and less participatory media to somewhat mitigate this. Only in the wake of the campaign, once a printed book was produced, were more voices heard and subject positions presented. Welcome to How to Build the Future. Today our guest is Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, Mark, you have built one of the most influential companies in the history of the world, so we are especially (laughs) excited that you are here. I'm not sure where to go from there. (laughs) Um, (laughs) If we do have a participatory media culture, it is not just expressed through discrete forms like image macros, mashup videos, blog posts, or podcast episodes. It also relies on immersive environments in which that participation subsists. Foremost amongst these environments are those afforded by social media platforms. In their early days, social media were frequently seen and promoted as enabling new voices, novel and sometimes inventive forms of political expression. But things have changed. Now, not only do we rightfully worry about the power of companies like Facebook and Google over our personal data or in deciding what is or is not allowed on their platforms, it is also that there is increasing awareness about how platforms work as software-sorted environments. Social media are not just platforms from which people can express themselves or share information. They are also computational platforms that manage how users and the information they share is made visible. Social media structure how users interact, for example with features like following, tagging, and liking. What users do on the platform becomes machine-readable data, which is then aggregated and used to reinform how the platform works. For example, the posts you see in a feed or personalized recommendations presented to you. Some of this can be ascribed to the work of algorithms, which we discuss in our next episode. For our present purposes, what is important is to think through what this means for thinking about a participatory media culture. Is it really sufficient to say that social media, understood as environments, are mere delivery systems, as one reading of Henry Jenkins might suggest? Or do we see social media as producing distinctly new kinds of participation? In a well-known 2010 piece, Dana Boyd argues that social media bring about networked publics, 
distinctive in how they automatically archive user contributions. Contributions which can be easily retrieved, replicated, modified, searched, and also unpredictably scaled up to very large audiences. And Boyd was writing in 2010, before the rise of newer, more ephemeral and non-archiving social media such as Snapchat and TikTok, which arguably provide further permutations of network publicness. The larger point here is that, as environments, social media platforms complicate what participation even means. Sure, they host explicit forms of participation, such as making comments or sharing bits of audiovisual content. But in creating a structured environment, they also enable implicit participation because simply by being on the platform, you make yourself visible in structured ways to others and they to you. There seems to be a consensus that contemporary politics is at a low point, that we live in a world in which many seem to accept relativized facts, or to put it more simply, shamelessly lying in public and also one in which aggression, rudeness, bullying, and quarrelsome behavior are becoming totally normal. Jason Hannon, in a 2018 article in the European Journal of Communication, observes that there are two ways of framing this apparent situation. One is to basically see this as a problem of quality standards, that what we need is better and more effective fact-checking of public discourses, through reinvigorated professional media and improved media literacy among the public at large. The second frame, however, is to see the problem as more deep-rooted and related to our dominant media technologies. This perspective would point out that such media technologies not only shape the content of public discourse, but structure how it is emotionally or affectively experienced. Hannon offers an unequivocal view that we should focus on the second frame. We need to understand, he argues, how social media, in particular, restructures the logic of public discourse and what counts as truth. Do you watch television? I, I love television. Uh, I think it's particularly good um, in sports. I think that's its strong point. I, I try never to watch television when uh, it's serious, because I always find that an embarrassment when uh, people like uh, Tom Brokaw or, or um, uh, Walter Cronkite uh, pretend that they're doing something serious. I'm always embarrassed by that and prefer to watch old movies and sports. Hannon's key touchstone is Neil Postman's well-known 1985 book, Amusing Ourselves to Death. In this book, Postman puts forward the thesis that the television medium has led to a deterioration of public discourse. The thesis largely depends on juxtaposing television discourses to those perpetuated through print. Television, Postman argues, prioritizes sensations over ideas. It structures the presentation of issues through striking imagery and fleeting transitions. It demands not time-consuming contemplation or critical reflection, but transitory and passive engagement. It is not that the matters discussed on television are inherently unserious, but that they are structured into a mode of entertainment. A debate involving a panel of serious intellectuals will be put under time constraints and format constraints, compelling the participants to state their arguments in a way that lacks substance. The main U.S. news programs on television, at least as they were in the 1980s, are essentially discontinuous and fragmented sets of discursive packages. As Hannon points out, Postman's observations about news seem to almost prophesize political discourse today. As Postman says, quote, I should go so far as to say that embedded in the surrealistic frame of a television news show is a theory of anti-communication, featuring a type of discourse that abandons logic, reason, sequence, and rules of contradiction, end quote. Television remains a dominant structuring environment for political discourse today. But Hannon argues that social media has arisen as an equally dominant political environment. And he says, quote, If television turned politics into a show business, then social media might be said to have turned it into a giant high school, replete with cool kids, losers, and bullies. End quote. Barack Obama's 2008 election campaign, particularly as it manifested through a platform like Facebook, is akin, Hannon says, to a high school popularity contest. Obama was not just present on social media, he had the right kind of presence. Sharing photos of his everyday life, his tastes in music or films, his choice celebrity friendships, all the while ironically poking fun at himself. People were probably most keen to associate with who he was rather than what his policies were. He was cool. Cool to identify with, share content about, and indeed, for those eligible in the United States, cool to vote for. 
Donald Trump's ascendance eight years later showed us, Hannon says, a different and perhaps darker side to social media, evident in Trump's enthusiastic embrace of Twitter, one akin to, quote, a schoolyard run by bullies. Hannon focuses in particular on the prevalence of trolling, which he defines broadly as political discourses that deliberately intend to spark disagreements, or be shocking, offensive, or hurtful. Trump is only an extreme example. Trolling involves a different kind of political popularity contest, modulated by the narrow parameters of a status update, in which the disturbance or reaction caused is the main measure of communicative success. We could spend an entire podcast picking over Trump's tweets. The one-sentence assertions, the frequent use of all caps and exclamation points, the repetitive phrases like mega, fake news, the failing mainstream media, and just sad. Not to mention all the deliberate tweeted provocations wreaking havoc in international as well as domestic affairs. We might note, however, just a couple of things. First, that in the end, the only solution to Trump's disinformation, from Twitter's point of view, was to controversially flip the kill switch and exclude Trump from the medium permanently and entirely. And second, that Trump's subsequent failed attempt to start his own blog tells us something about the degree to which social media has become an unavoidable infrastructure of public communication. As media scholar Philip Napoli observes in a May 2021 piece in Wired, quote, not even the most public of public figures can break free from the platform dependency that largely dictates the distribution of audience attention online. If Trump's blog can't gain traction without direct access to the audience aggregation and amplification tools of social media, then perhaps nothing can, end quote. Hannon's account of political discourses through social media is compelling in its presentation. It is full of insights and provocative metaphors which seem to ring true. It is clear he has a distaste for, or at least a suspicion of, what has become of political discourse through social media, much in the same way Postman saw television. A possible limitation is that even though Hannon proclaims a focus on technology, he does not really pay close attention to the workings of social media platforms. This is not a criticism so much as a clarification. For Hannon, mediums are not defined in narrowly technical ways— Rather, they are forms of discourse. At least at the level of pattern recognition, Hannon seems to convincingly show that social media platforms shape political discourses and participation in ways that are distinct, if still differentiated. It is our task in the remaining episodes to undertake a couple of more specific inquiries, which might explore the ways some of these patterns are produced. So, until then, I'm Scott Rogers, and you've been listening to Media, Technology, and Culture. Thank you.